a, a velvet taco at the time. Okay. And you also requested, well, let me ask you this. After you got those phone records, were there any other search warrants you requested? Yes. Okay. Uh, go through another, what's the another warrant that you went through? went and got well again i think there's a total of 17 so is there one specifically uh, just about? for mr green so let me ask you did you get one for apple yes okay what was the basis for that um the basis for the apple warrant uh, i could tell you i of the 17 search warrants the affidavits provide some of the same basic facts but then the probable cause is a little bit different for each individual warrant that i applied for um, to recite from memory, um, from I believe it's like a 270 page lead supplement of facts, as well as the 17 affidavits, I wouldn't be able to sit here and recite them from memory, all of those facts. But I can tell you generally. Well, let me stop you. Maybe I can make this a little bit easier. Were you aware that he had a, uh, an Apple account? Yes. How, how did you have that information? When he provided the name Tyree Clark. Um, there were some things that I noted, uh, what he uh, uh, provided to the responding officer to the initial robbery. Tyree Clark, I believe his birthday was only about five days off from his real birthday for Quayshon Green. And um, he provided the email address, I believe it was gfnquay at icloud.com, which Quay was a variation of Quayshon, I noted, rather than Tyree. And, um, and it was an iCloud um, account, which is specific to Apple. In addition, when I met with Mr. Green at his residence, he navigated through his phone, and that's when I had asked him. That's the interview we did not play at his residence. But I had asked him during that interview in his home if I could see who he was in communication with that night. And although he verbally provided a nickname and a phone number, um, he did not allow me to hold the phone, yet I could see as he held it that it was an Apple iPhone. And so application uh, warrant 20 SW 013. Yes. And is that the uh, affidavit and application you submitted? Yes. And again, I'm going to ask whether um, page, the page 1 through 11 were submitted to the judge for signature. Yes. Okay. And... Did you provide any additional testimony to the judge in regard to that one? No, I don't. I don't recall the judge having any questions about uh, the warrant application. Okay. And did you also get um, an affidavit, or I'm sorry, a, a search warrant for Facebook? Yes. And is that twenty SW zero one ten? Twenty SW zero one zero zero ten, essentially, instead of zero one ten. Yes. And did you have information in regard to him having a Facebook account? Yes. And what specifically was that, if you recall? Um, the So let me make sure, because there's two to Facebook as it relates to accounts related to him. And I just want to be sure. Um, so yeah, 0110 is for uh, Facebook. And that's an account through investigation that we saw. Um, the name of the account was Green. Images displayed on the account were those of Mr. Quayshon Green, and um, and uh, that's that's how. And there's other specific articulable facts that are in the affidavit that identify that as um, uh, seemingly his account, uh, and th that's how we identified it as his. So you just opened up a Facebook account and typed in the name to try to see if he had an account? Um, I don't recall exactly how we uh, identified that through investigation as, as his. Um, I can uh, briefly refresh my recollection through the affidavit, if, if you'd like. Is it your testimony today you had independent information in regard to the idea that Mr. Green had a Facebook account? When you say independent information, I, through investigation, I opened up this account, and it appears to be his account, and the name of the account is his name. And then, then you got this search warrant? B based on the... the Seven-page affidavit, uh, the facts in the seven-page affidavit, yes. Did you also get um, a search warrant for Uber? Yes. 
And is that uh, warrant 20SW015? <clears throat> Yes. And did you have information um, that Mr. Green had an Uber account? Um, uh, again, I, I'd have to refresh my recollection from the facts of whether or not he had. Um, I can tell you what I recall that first um, indicated to me that Uber records may be relevant was Mr. Green's statement that he had taken an Uber home from Velvet Taco that night. And um, I believe he said that his mother had provided the Uber. Um, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to misspeak, um, and we did not play that first interview, but I believe that he said during that first interview that he may have his own Uber account as well. Um, so I... I uh, yes, I believe I had good information that he had an Uber account, but moreover that um, he had taken an Uber from his mother's account home that night, and the warrant sought records for any accounts in his name and or his mother's name. And again, with that uh, search warrant 20SW015, uh, did you submit that with the corresponding pages that end in seven? Yes, to the judge. Yes. And do you recall if you gave any uh, independent um, new information in regard to those search warrants? Uh, I don't recall the judge having any questions outside of what was in the affidavit. <laughs> and on these search warrants that um, we're talking about, did you do any returns on them? Did you file any returns? I don't believe so. Why not? Um, I... I don't have a, a valid reason for not, not submitting a return to the court. And on 20SW012 uh, warrant, did you get a search warrant for Google? I did. And what was the basis of that search warrant? Uh, again, I, I, I'd say that the basis of the warrant um, is articulated in the uh, facts and the affidavit as submitted to the judge. Um, but generally speaking, um, what I knew was that there were uh, four armed gunmen that entered the restaurant and engaged in the armed robbery. Uh, there was a vehicle that was spotted leaving the scene of the crime or the general area of the crime right after the four men fled the back back out the way that they came um, and went back around to that parking lot over there off of uh, Early Street. And um, it that, that vehicle became a vehicle of focus, which told me that there may have been four, there may have been more inside the car that fled. But what I knew was that there were multiple co-conspirators. Um, the affidavit articulates uh, why um, someone with a cell phone uh, might report location history information to Google and why that would be relevant to identify any of the individuals that were involved in this armed robbery um, with location information. So this is a Google geofence warrant. And what it sought to do was identify any devices that were reporting location history information uh, to Google that were in the area of the crime and that left the scene of the crime in a manner consistent with the way the vehicle left the scene of the crime. And did you file a return on that? No. And on, I think this is the last one, 20SW009, this is another uh, Facebook warrant.
Yes. And this is for FL Quay? Yes. And did you have information that Mr. Green was using that handle? Uh, again, uh, the, the facts are in the affidavit, um, but yes, I believe I did. Uh, so at the time of this warrant application, um, two things that I recall from my recollection, uh, and again, I'd, I'd rely more on the affidavit to, to more firmly refresh my recollection. I'm happy to review that if, if you'd prefer me to, or I can tell you generally that I recall I asked Mr. Green what he was doing on the cell phone when I first met with him at his home, what he was doing on his cell phone down by the dumpsters as the robbery was going on around the block inside the Velvet Taco. He said that he was on Instagram, which um, informed me that he may have an Instagram account. In addition, um, Mr. Westmoreland, um, and, and I recall now the details of Mr. Uh, Green's arrest, it was when the warrants had been flagged for his arrest and he and Mr. Westmoreland, who had essentially absconded from their schedule at the Velvet Taco, um, called the Velvet Taco and said that they wanted to come back to work and they were apprehended upon their arrival at the Velvet Taco. Um, so they were, um, Mr. Westmoreland had another unrelated warrant for his arrest and they were both brought to headquarters that night. Mr. Westmoreland consented- I'm stop you. We don't, we don't, we're not worried about Mr. Westmoreland. What's well, relevant to how I identified Mr. Green's account. Okay. Go, I mean, go ahead with your response. Yeah. Mr. Westmoreland consented to an extraction of his cell phone. And uh, from that, I was able to get some Instagram information and communication. And that added to um, showing that uh, Mr. Green was connected to that account. And again, um, this warrant, S20SW009, it had the corresponding um, pages to it. Yes. It appears that four is written twice. Is this the Instagram or the geofence that we're talking I'm so, about? I'm sorry. Uh, this is the Facebook. Facebook, okay. Moved on. I'm sorry. Your question was, it appears that what's written twice? I'm sorry. Um, page four. And then if you turn the page over, it says page four. Um, not on my copy. May I, may I approach yes. the witness? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. You may. And I, the only thing I've written on this uh, printed copy is the date that I it was signed. And uh, I do, you're welcome to take it if you like. Okay, uh, uh, mine only mine shows four and four. I'm not really sure why that is, but um, in looking at what the state has provided as a certified copy, it does indicate it's numbered one through seven. Correct. Yes, that's correct. And that's what you submitted to the judge. Yes. And again, is there a return? No. One moment, Your Honor. Thank you. Nothing further. Okay, Ms. Elkham. No other questions for the detective regarding Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Jones's clients, Mr. Defendant Green. Okay. All right. Well, you're excused for now, then, Detective. Well, we still need it for Mr. Bynes as well, Your Honor. Well, that's what I meant by now, but but uh, I had to be more specific about because it, it actually messed me up in a trial uh, where I um, I told a witness they were excused and we needed her back. Uh, long story, short story, long story short, but it didn't matter. Ended up being acquittal. I'm sure I would have heard about it. <laughs> if it was a conviction, I'm sure it would have been in there. But uh, um, <clears throat> should I step down, Judge? Well, I'm trying to think of where where we're at. So that was the motion to suppress, and um, yes, that's the Jackson Day or the search warrant. And so, what do you have anything left, Miss Jones? I mean, the, I know you've got the 418. 
Yeah, that doesn't mean any detective judge. Yes, yeah, so I'm trying to think of how we can do this efficiently. That's all you have, right, Miss um, Jones? Well, we have the 418. Yeah, but he's not going to be around for that. That's it for, for you. All right, so let's... Um, Who who else is gonna who who else is gonna need a detective besides you, Mr. Hoover? Is there any other defense attorneys that need a detective? I think it's just me. Just him. All right. Let's excuse Mr. Green then. Let's bring out your client and do the uh and let's take a break. Let's take you wanna take is that what you wanna take a let's take a five minute break. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, I, he's the guy that's coming back. He just needs to switch. switch. I don't know. So he's going back, but don't take him down yet. They say he got to come back out. No. He just needs to switch out. So he's going to come back for arguments. But she's just another detective. Right right now, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going out. Thank you. You. I don't know why mine ends oh, I'm sorry. No, maybe I uh do talk to you because I didn't I said it all. Because he said I'm me, not saying you did. No, 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 no. I mean sometimes that happens that when they over like you know when they because they scan everything in. Yeah. So it might be from our end. Or it could have just end. been um that's what I mean. Because I can't well, you know how you like get all of them uh -huh. and print them. So maybe it just maybe got, just yeah. I just I I relied. I was like, I'm not gonna rely on this, I'm just gonna go to court. <laughs> I just get a certified copy of everything. It's just oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Trust me. I've run into issues with it before. So I just oh. just go to the court oh. and let them yeah. give you what they have. Uh -huh. No, you have need to for purposes of um. No, I mean like where you live. No, yes, from the club shop. I'm such a No, they do have. They have an email for us. You know the way. We don't have to go down anymore. We can just email them and give them 40 hours. Oh, no. Email you back. Let's get out of that. Oh, that's good. That's better. Yeah. Yeah. So it's for that. If you need to do it, hold on, hold on. I mean, technically, I'm going to say, Marcus, what is it? It's the testimony document. The Marcus, but for purposes of this, it is and it's just easier. I don't have. I, I, I don't like. Oh, yeah. Was he on his motion calendar? Uh -huh. yeah. I feel like I stole this from somebody, and I think it was Mr. Clark. Well, somehow I ended up with two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I just leave it. Because it's just it's for purposes of you know motion. <laughs> <laughs> Is that sort of like nine tenths of the law? It's because <laughs> our boss had me go visit the crime scene. We got there at the apartment complex and all the way around. So I jumped the fence. Like technically, it's technically, like, 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 I'm like, hello. I don't have my. Which is like, 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 Vines, bonds, 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 Right. Yes. Fine. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He's, he's, he's the guy. So can he go? Or do you still, are you still doing the gang thing? Or can he go? This he's sitting next to you too, right? Yeah. All right. That's my gang experts. What are you doing? Are you oh. still doing the 702 on him? Yeah. So you have to. Got to. All right. Yeah.
Okay. It's only but four o'clock. We're gonna be here till it's four o'clock. Yeah, let's, let's push. Push. No more break. Five so o'clock is when it ends. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm a state employee. With the public defender, you don't get overtime. We you don't get see, overtime either. Yeah, I see what he does. Overtime. Try and put in for him. So is yours, so the 24th is finishing. I'm picking up my little seats. Oh, no. no. So I start Monday in front of Barwick. Next week, I will possibly be in front of McAfee. The week after that, I'll be in Muskogee. No, yeah, Muskogee County. Doherty County. County. I don't and then the... Be back here in Fulton. For what day? And then Muskogee. Because we need to talk about it. Because I start petty on the 18th. And then that's because it takes us two days to pick the jury. So we pick the jury on the 19th. We begin evidence on Monday the 22nd. Yeah, I'm not with you on petty, right? No, you're not. You're on the court petty. Fine. Burn. Fine. Don't. Don't. So the 22nd. So, so you, I start that trial the 22nd. It's a two week and a half trial. Yeah, and I'll be in Doherty County. On the and then I'll be back here. And then I'll be. And then February is when we start the one you're on. The five which month? Or which? Kraus. Are you in Kraus? Is it not you? I don't know. Maybe it's not you. It's divine. I know, I know in February I'll be. My name is Doug. Well, no, that one just got continued. Okay. It's nice to meet you. I won in front of McBurney, and I won in Troop County. I don't think I'm on that one with Cross. Oh, okay. I'll find out. Because that's in February. That's yeah. going to take a month. It's going to take us a week. How many co-defendants? Five. It's a murder. Which case, or what the co-defendants' names? Uh, so the five that we're trying would be uh, Tyrell Caldwell, Khalil Smith, Demetrius Ortiz. That's what I'm saying. I feel like you're on one of them, but I, I'm not sure. No, Tyrell Caldwell, um, Demetrius Ortiz, Khalil Smith. What's his name? There are two more people. There's too many of them. Okay. Um, Amani Washington. We, we are just going to finish with the one defendant and then start with that. Yes. So we're going to do the 418. I don't know if we get to the 418 because we still need to do the games. But the 418 is only arguments. It doesn't need witnesses. So I think it's best that we get the witnesses out. That's true. I think it's best because no the 418 is just us arguing. But people that actually need to testify, they should go. Right, I get you. I understand. Just procedurally. So procedurally, since Detective Leon Parker is still on the stand, it's best that we just do his um, search warrant for him too. And then once that's done, then Detective Leon Parker is done. And then after that, it would be Investigator Miller for the gang's expert. It's a several people. I was just saying, I guess transcript-wise is where I'm getting confused. Oh, because he wasn't I, present for the first part of it so you no he's not launch back True. into the well i can tell you the only thing i need leo packers for is jackson dental i'm not i'm not moving to press search warrants okay the well Google then that's easy because we're just for the but i thought we just agreed that the the november or no december is it december 3rd 2020 or is it march 3rd 2020 that one we're not using but this cool phone conversation yeah the phone calls yeah yeah well then, then he's then he doesn't need to be yeah, if you put on the record that you're not going to use the interview where he was in the interrogation room, then we don't, yeah, we won't need him for anything. Oh, well, that was, well, then we shouldn't have taken a break. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that would have been quick. Yeah, because I'm attacking Google, the just the, whoever's going to bring in the Google Gmail. Not the search warrants. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Okay. So we're not using that because there's nothing in that in it. It's, huh? So, yeah, Google records don't apply to your clients, though. I know they do indirectly. No, 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 not the, he's talking about the expert. The expert. Just the, the try to The yeah, expert, yes. not, just, just not the lawyer. Yes. Okay. The expert, not yeah. the... It's not really the exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So, I think you're fine. We'll just have the judge release you and then you have the judge. 
because you're December. Um, I mean, you think so she wants to do another round of the trial? No, no, no. He said, uh, well, it's final, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, fine. I mean, if you're okay with that, it's fine. 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 It's fine.
It's the, the it's for the gangs in Atlanta because the Atlanta's in Atlanta are high risk. So all the gangs in Atlanta is qualified by. Right? So, so the bloods, the cribs, fifty something gangs. In no, 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 but no, 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 but all of them are subsets of the bloods or the cribs. That's my question. I would it down to the gangs specifically related to this. Yes, just this case. So the gangs are related. So you saw my thing. I sent it to you, right? I did. So yes. So just those ones we're going to qualify him an expert on that. And obviously, but the problem I always see is that when you say that. When they ask questions about other gangs, and then you object. Well, not you, but defense attorneys object and say he's not qualified in that. Well, and that's if, if that's you, my problem. Well, that's my issue as well because not you, obviously, but another DA qualified a gang yeah. expert as an Atlanta gang, and then I was told I can't ask about the other hundred fifty something. But then when she started talking about hybrid, she started talking about the other hundred fifty something, which kind of limited what I was prepared for. I see. So that's what I'm saying. As, he's not going to go into all of well, that. Well, he's going to talk about well for gang experts. He's talk, obviously he should know that they are hybrid gangs, and then we have uh, however many gangs that we're talking about. But his gang information will be tailored to obviously this gang. We're not going to talk about I don't know. I don't I know so many. Say five to seven. What is this slime gang? Young crew. You want to help? I, I, essentially, I think if anything, I probably go into. <laughs> Some of the national social <laughs> exactly there we go, but then specifically this local we'll talk about that. Hold on a second. That's what I would plan on going into. I probably wouldn't. All right. Now. So you tell them. That's what I need. So we're. I mean, if you want to ask me, <laughs> all right. I'll talk to you about it. Well, well, I mean that that's the difference between us having like a four hour cross and us having like. 30 minutes. That, that's what I'm just trying to what, say. What, what was the issue with because Judge, I yeah. think we, I apologize. We might have to um, release Detective Leon Packer because he was trying to suppress his statements, but the state and the defense have agreed that the statement he's trying to suppress so that we're clear it's March 2nd of 2020. And that's the statement that Defendant Bynes gave when he was in custody and Detective Leon Packer attempted to talk to him. The defendant invoked and did not speak. And so that statement, the states will not be using in our case in chief. And we wanted to be clear for the specific statements because obviously he had other calls that he talked to him. And so that's why we're particular. It's March 2nd of 2020. And it was the in custody statement that de de I'm sorry, defendant Bynes gave. The states will not be using that in our case in chief. Okay. Yes. And, and so I know I was out on another call. My court reporter, I think, brought it up to y'all. It just there may be issues with the transcript, but I, I think it's something we worked through. He can just re re explain his uh, credentials very briefly. Yes, Your Honor, and I will. And and I'll put on the record as long as the states already put on the record that they will not use that recording or that interview, yeah. then we don't even need to go through a Jackson dinner with it. Okay. Okay. Yes. And what recording is that again? March 2nd of 2020 in custody statement of defendant Bites. Okay. All right. So what do we have left? And that would be it with Detective Leon Barker, just arguments for those, for the search warrants and the Jackson Deno, he'll be done. And then it will be the gang. Yes. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Bynes was not present though before. So I, I, I think we're going to have to, I know he's under oath, but re, um, reestablish the, uh, the witness. So no, he's not an expert, but we don't need him anymore. Yeah, oh, 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 okay. All right. Well, you're excused. Right. You're excused. Would be investigator Miller for the gang Dalbert hearing. So we're done with the Jackson Daniel and the search warrant. Okay. Explain. So we're asking if you want us to do the arguments go straight into arguments and then we would need green or do you want us to have investigator miller testify for the gang um for his dober hearing as a gang expert That's well and i'm also trying to figure out because we have we have i'm trying to do this efficiently as well uh because they're co-defendants so would it be better to bring green back out yes judge that's what i was asking for. let's do that all right, slide there. i'm all for efficiency and yes, i will sir. slide down unless miss jones objects yeah <laughs> i don't know 
Well, who else do we have that? Pardon me. I'm Karen Rhodes. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm like, I'm good. What? Who? Whose client is Rhodes? Bumpus. Where's Bumpus? He's one. Thank you. Is it terrible? Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Can you ask the all the way down and bring one more, one more out? Yeah. Is Bumpus ready to go? Oh, oh, okay. Just put him here. He's no, because oh, oh. are you fine with the? Oh, some are, some are. No, you let to see by your client though. Yeah, I was just gonna put him on the side, like. Yeah, I'm bringing I'm gonna put him right here. No and what about King? So King's a no go, King right? Has never brought over. Okay, the they did not bring him over. I'm not sure why. Not they not proper well, follow up on that. I mean, okay. you know, can't just be going to a black hole and not bring him over again next time. I mean, there needs to be some ramification to it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so this they just, no. they just, no. Doesn't fit. You must. Well, we need to. I don't know how that goes. One more person, but come out. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I mean, somebody needs to say, hey, he's not coming over. Don't, you know. Fortunately. Oh, yeah. Well, I agree. I agree with that on the 418. Is that what you were asking me in there? Don't even on the more chair. Well, it's right here. So it's, it's, it's another guy back. Miss Bumpus' client coming out. Too, I believe. Is she here? Bumpus is online. No, her client's oh. coming out too. But her client's coming out. Yeah. So I got it. Yeah, that's why we didn't do it. So we're gonna we're gonna have to do the four eighteen again, but it it'll just be with. Uh... Yeah, that's what it, that's what we're seeing, Judge, because like, we understand that we have a time crunch. So we're thinking we do the ones that we have the witnesses, and because the four eighteen is just argument. But I'm saying that King's going to have to be, he's got a 418 that we're going to have to address at some point. Yeah, well, yes. And I think but, you, you picked the 25th. But, but. Is Miss Bumpus acknowledged that she's online and listening? And Yes, I'm here, Judge. All right, all right. Well, let, why don't you at least show your face? I mean, you know, come okay, on Okay, Judge, now. one second. What do you want him? Uh, all right. Yes, yes. yes. And then the last guy, she's going to get the other guy. Where's he gonna? Oh, he's gonna sit over there. Where you? I'll sit here. Yeah, you sit here. Perfect. And he'll sit over there. And we're we you? Yeah, right. I feel like musical chairs. Now is um, just. So are we doing the four eighteen first, or are we doing because all, everyone's here? Yeah. We're about doing the, I would do the no. We're doing the seven oh two the game. Because everyone is here for that. Because I think they're all on it. They all joined for them. Perfect. So. Wait, wait, wait a minute. The, the seven oh two, which is the Dow Burr. Yeah. Or the X. The qualification of the expert witness. Yes. Yes. Okay. And they all joined, which is why they I all joined. Okay. All right. Okay. All of them need to be here. Yes. And your honor, um, now that everyone's friend. here, I can tell you after speaking with the state, based off of this, may be even shortened, shortened even more than it usually is, based off of how they're gonna, what type of expert he's gonna be. Um, uh, we'll see. I'm doing my best to lengthen it, but I we'll. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> all right. So. <laughs> we have, and let me raise, let me see you raise your hand. So we have, this is, we have Corey Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes, that's, okay, so Mr. Rhodes is present in the courtroom. His attorney, Miss Bumpus, is appearing by Zoom. Do you hear me, Miss Bumpus? Yes, Judge. All right. Um, so Mr. Rhodes, you're, your attorney's not here. If there's something that you need to speak about with her privately, I mean, they're just motions. But if there is, let me know, and we will arrange for you to be able to speak with her privately, okay? You understand that? Do I have your permission to go forward with your attorney appearing by Zoom? Yes. Okay. And then the next one we have is Catavius Bynes, who's present in the courtroom, Mr. Hoover. That's you, Mr. Bynes, correct? And then we've already, we've had Mr. Green in here and we have Mr. Green present with his attorney, Ms. Jones. And we have Ms. Oakham representing the state. And so we are going to go, we were going to first address this, the 702 motion, the expert witness qualifications um, and who wants to handle this 702 motion. Your Honor, state calls investigator Miller. Your I believe Detective Leon Packer has done, may he be excused? You're excused, Mr. Packer. Thank you, 
may now state that it's done with him from Pepper. Investigator James Miller, J A M E S M I L L E R. Good afternoon, uh, Investigator. Can you tell me where you're employed, please? Yes, I'm employed by the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. And how long have you been in that employment? I've been employed with the Fulton County DA's office uh, for a little over two and a half years. And prior to that, where were you employed? So prior to that, I was with uh, the Cherokee County DA's office. And then prior to that, I was with DeKalb County Police Department. And then prior to that, I was with Douglas County Sheriff's Office. So what's your total law enforcement experience? Uh, a little over eight years, law okay. enforcement. Are you post certified? I am. <clears throat> and have you ever uh, been involved in gang investigation? I have. Okay. And what, what can you tell us about that? Yes. So um, I, I get involved with gang investigations uh, pretty regularly in my day-to-day -day, uh, job here at the DA's office. Uh, I also get contacted by various law enforcement agencies around Fulton County uh, to assist in investigations, uh, as well as outside of the county um, and across the state, as well as with federal agencies, I, I will get contacted for gang investigations. Uh, this can involve in uh, uh, search warrants, to uh, identifying identifying signs of gangs, uh, identifying signs of tattoos or uh, symbology that's used in tattoos or other identifiers. Uh, sometimes I get contacted for graffiti as well. Uh, it, it really depends on the situation, but those are kind of my day-to-day -day duties. Okay. And what background training and experience qualifies you to perform these? So I started uh, my initial gang training uh, at the academy where we received approximately eight hours of gang identification training at the academy, which involves different signs, symbols of a lot of the traditional gangs around the nation. Um, I also have training through the Georgia Gang Investigators Association, uh, specifically basic gang investigator certification, intermediate gang investigator certification, uh, I've taken uh, several training classes through Gypstick to include, uh, yes, uh, the Georgia Public Safety Training Center, uh, which is located in Forsyth, which is a centralized location for uh, Georgia Post law enforcement officers uh, and those who are certified in, at Georgia Post certified for training. Um, and training that I've obtained from there has been gang ID uh, identification, which is very similar to uh, some of the basic courses I've gone through. Um, I've also uh, regularly teach and instruct uh, at Gypstick, the Georgia Post uh, training, as well as through uh, other agencies across the state. And are you currently any members of any, um, are you a member of any associations in regards to your gang um, investigation? Yes, I'm a member of several uh, organizations, one being the Georgia Gang Investigators Association. Uh, not only am I a member, but I'm also a, uh, I'm on the board of directors for the organization. I hold the position as a vice president of the Atlanta Metro region, which encompass Fulton, Cobb, Gwinnett, DeKalb, Rockdale, Clayton uh, counties, and Gwinnett. I don't know if I said Gwinnett. Uh, so, so Metro Atlanta counties. Um, and that encompasses uh, members from all the agencies that are involved. Uh, that can be Atlanta Police, East Point, College Park, Gwinnett PD, DeKalb PD, and so on. Uh, and every gang investigator at those different agencies will kind of fall under uh, my directive as far as training and uh, different intelligence meetings that we have throughout the state. Okay. And um, is this an all I'm sorry, is this continuous training on information on gangs or do you just stop when you have enough information? Uh, no, gangs are uh, constantly evolving and changing, uh, so it's important to stay uh, up to date on trends, not only nationally, uh, internationally, but also locally. And that's why we kind of have uh, regularly attended uh, gang intel meetings locally. Um, we hold two a, a month, actually. Okay, and you go for those meetings? Yes, I do, as well as staying uh, in constant connection with members through uh, email and uh, different forms of communication. Okay. Can you tell us, I've provided an estimate of how many gang members you believe you've come in contact with in all your years of experience as a gang investigator? I can't give you an, uh, an exact number, but I can say it, I have come in contact with over 100 gang members in, throughout my career. 
And when you come in contact with them, do you speak to them? Yes. And, and to uh, clarify, when I'm speaking with gang members, oftentimes in my job, uh, it, it's not always uh, in custody. Sometimes it's uh, out of custody and, and communications. So it's not always uh, in interview settings. Okay. And when you talk to them and you get this information, do you keep it or do you see this or do you share this information with um, other officers, I guess, other police departments within the gang sphere? Yes, I, I regularly share this information with other gang investigators throughout this, not only just the state, uh, but throughout the nation. And so do you, it, the two meetings we are talking about, are those regular intelligence meetings or are they just ongoing meetings to keep up abreast of the gangs that are related in Atlanta? So those are uh, regular gang intel meetings that we hold one in Cobb County and then the other one is hold, uh, held in uh, Gwinnett County. Uh, we also hold uh, another one that's not uh, it's not every month, but it's pretty regularly. Uh, that's at, usually at South Fulton. Um, but these are about uh, updated gang trends, what other agencies are seeing going on in their jurisdictions. Uh, it's also a good networking uh, event for officers to be able to uh, help identify co-defendants and co-conspirators of active cases. And do you, um, have you aided in investigations, including sort of like search warrants, investigating a gang case, and um, <coughs> do other officers ask for your assistance in gang cases? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. So I regularly get asked to assist in um, with uh, various search warrants throughout investigations from uh uh, from individuals from my agency to in other agencies to include uh, APD. And APD, is that Atlanta Police Department? Yes, ma'am. And what types of information, gang information, gang-related information do you get when you um, when you execute those um, warrants? Uh, so it varies uh, depending on what type of records I'm requesting or what type of uh, information I'm getting. Uh, it, 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 were, it would vary from like a house search warrant to uh, Instagram or social media search warrant or like a cell phone um, or I, you know, I've, I've even done tattoos or tattoo search warrants uh, at the jail. So it really just uh, varies for what type of evidence I was going to be collecting. Uh, but that evidence can include photos of uh, gang members or associates of gangs, uh, identifying signs, symbols, uh, ledgers, rosters, books of knowledge, uh, and so on. And when you say ledgers and books of knowledge, what do you mean by that? So ledgers uh, can be like a roll call, for example. It's oftentimes gangs, they do have um, uh, written ledgers for, for their list of members or it could be dues owed. It's very common for traditional gangs to have uh, sort of dues. Um, books and knowledge is a uh, some other terminology for different uh, sayings and beliefs that the organization would have. And um, you said you are a member. Do you also do you teach classes on gangs as well? Yes, I regularly teach at uh, Georgia Gang Investigators Association. We have uh, regular classes throughout the year. I'm also a faculty instructor at the Prosecuting Attorneys Council of Georgia. Um, I also have taught at uh, Kennesaw State, uh, Georgia State. Uh, universities on uh, organized crime and different lectures of that. Uh, I've also do community outreach programs throughout the county and throughout the state as well uh, on different type of gang preventative measures, whether it's gang investigations, gang prevention, gang prosecution, um, or uh, prevention. And is it common for other sworn law enforcement officers to seek your expertise, expertise? In identifying gangs and gang members? Yes, I regularly get contacted. Have you ever been qualified as an expert in criminal street gang and criminal street gang activity? I have. Okay. And where what let's start with counties. What counties have you been part of? I have been qualified uh, as a gang expert in Fulton, Clayton, and Cherokee County. And approximately how many times would you say you've um, testified as an expert? Approximately seven.
And have you ever been taking part in the things and what is it, task forces related to gang activity? So I have uh, never been assigned to a task force. However, I commonly work with uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations Gang Task Force, uh, the gang units at APD, DeKalb, Gwinnett, and the other jurisdictions. I also regularly work with uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, their gang task force uh, called Safe Streets. Um, I've also worked with the U.S. Marshals Gang Task Force, but I have never been assigned to any of these specific task force. And so you are aware of the defini definition of criminal street gang? Yes. And what is a criminal street gang? So criminal street gang is a group of three or more individuals, whether formally or, or informally, that engage in criminal street gang activity. Are you aware of, so then what is criminal gang activity? So criminal street gang activity is um, specifically the crimes that are enumerated in the code section, uh, specifically um, crimes of violence, drug offenses, theft, uh, offenses under RICO, some stalking offenses, sex offense, some sex offenses, uh, as well as narcotics offenses and gun violations. And so just because three people are in a gang, does that mean that's a crime? Sorry, could you repeat that question again? If three people commit a crime together, does that mean that it is criminal gang activity or a criminal gang? Not necessarily, no. And why is that? So, uh, so just because uh, three individuals are, uh, we can even say that they're part of an organization that is um, not a criminal street gang, let's just say uh, a college fraternity. If those three individuals go and commit that crime and they're part of this fraternity, if they in some make a crime, that doesn't necessarily benefit the gang. It doesn't further their uh, status within the fraternity. It doesn't benefit the fraternity. It actually makes the fraternity look bad. So there's no nexus element of the offense. And that would not be ap applicable to 1615-4, which is the code section for uh, the gang law. And so then how do you join a gang then? So there's uh, multiple ways to join a criminal street gang. Uh, the three most common are uh, to be, one is to be beat in, uh, another one is to be uh, blessed in, and another one is, uh, which was used by a lot of females, uh, kind of like, I don't know, in the 90s and so forth, uh, it was to be sexed in. Uh, it's not so common anymore with females, but uh, to describe those, uh, a beat in is for a set amount of time depicted by the specific gang set uh, some gangs, it might be 31 seconds, some it may be longer. It could be a minute, 60 seconds, depending on the gang itself. Uh, but it's determined, and it could be like a three-on-one where three individuals jumping on one person. It could be a five-on-one, depending on the subset specifically. It could also be a one-on-one. -on -one. It just kind of depends on who is holding this beat-in. A blessed-in is uh, typically when a uh, individual is already connected to the Colonel Street gang, whether it be by... Uh, birth, like if their father, uncle, big older brother, or some type of uh, close family tie, uh, and they don't have to actually go in through the initiation phase of being beaten. Um, another aspect of uh, what some individuals be consider being blessed in is if you commit crime for that organization, uh, you can be blessed into an in the certain organizations as well. Um, and then the sexton is um, a female equivalent of having to have sex with multiple members to be initiated into the criminal street gang. And uh, in your experience, what motivates a person to join a criminal street gang? So there's several motivations uh, to want to join a criminal street gang. Uh, some of that can be uh, the notoriety of, uh, of, of the respect that the criminal street gangs um, demand. It also can be uh, to make money uh, or the sense of belonging to something. Um, some individuals, like I said a little bit before my testimony, it, it could be a family tie that kind of wants to, that's why they want to join is they want to be connected and closer to that family. Um, that's a lot of, that's a lot of the reasons why th these individuals join. You just talked about respect. Is respect important in gang culture? Yes. So re respect is, uh, the most important thing in gang culture, uh, specifically whatever, 
if, if a gang is disrespected uh, or a member is disrespected of, of an organization, that could be um, – that can make that organization as a self look bad. Uh, and really how these gangs take control over communities is through fear and intimidation of how they perceive respect. Uh, so when you're operating crimes in an area, um, how do you get the community to not – uh, cooperate with law enforcement and how you can have a fruitful business of a criminal organization is to instill that fear and intimidation. Um, respect can also be for protection as far as if your gang is known for killing individuals, you would not be targeted by another organization out of fear of re uh, retribution. Um, so it, also respect is how you would gain status within the organization itself. Um, if you're, if you're not respected, you can't grow in the organization. Okay. So, so you have to, so what do you do to gain respect then in the game? So to gain respect, you can gain respect in multiple ways. Uh, you can make money for the gang and, uh, distribute it to the organization itself. That could be paying dues and just doing what you need to do as far as what you're told, uh, it can also be committing crimes of violence and committing crimes for the gang to further the gang in that sense. Um, there, there are several ways, uh, but a lot of it is putting in what they call putting in work. And uh, putting in that work is uh, usually by conducting criminal activity, such as robberies or homicides or shootings of that nature, drug sales. How much more do we have on his expertise, Ms. Oakham? Uh, that, and I just wanted to ask, are you familiar with the gangs in Atlanta? I am familiar with the, with most of the gangs in Metro Atlanta. Okay. And you keep up to date with all of these gangs that are in Atlanta? I do. I, I do. There, there are approximately over 150 gangs operating in Metro Atlanta. I'm uh, familiar with most of them. Uh, and, and I stay up to date on their trends. Yes. Nothing. Right. Okay. I'll let Mr. Hoover take the lead on this since it's his motion. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> I will try to make this as quick as I can. Okay. All right. So is it Investigator Miller? Yes, yes, sir. And what's your first name, Miller? James. James, thank you. A lot of people call me JP, so. JP. <laughs> All right, so you talked, about the, you talked about you had training in the academy, and you said you started talking about how it was different signs and symbols. Correct. Could you walk the judge through one of the trainings that you actually had? What did you do? What did you experience? How were you tested? Do you want me to walk through, like, an, an entire eight-hour course or some? <laughs> well, we, oh, but, or I can breathe we, it. Well, let me say it like this. You said that you had training, but we don't know what that training is. Okay. So can explain to us what the training entails. So some of the training that we have is um, we have an individual come in who has worked gangs for several years of their career, uh, explain the different traditional gangs, which there are a lot, uh, but to break it down into a simpler uh, explanation, uh, you might have an individual teaching about uh, bloods, Crips, gangster disciples, and different subsets that fall within those organizations, as well as different alliances from traditional organizations. Um, in the academy, I, I can say we didn't really go into a lot of the hybrid stuff that we see today um, or that we have in Metro Atlanta, but it's kind of like a broad uh, understanding of different signs and symbols uh, of these different organizations. <laughs> Uh, different crimes that they have committed, um, different uh, teachings or, or beliefs that they may do, uh, which varies from different subsets uh, across the nation. Now, in regards to these people that came in to these trainings, um, how many of them were not in some type of law enforcement? Um, throughout my career or for the academy? So, sorry, I just want to... Let's go, you're training in the academy because that's where we're... So at, at the academy, I don't think I received any training uh, from a non-law enforcement officer uh, on criminal street gangs. Okay. Now, you said that they came in and spoke. Was this one, a type of all of y'all were in the auditorium? They came and spoke, you clapped, a, and y'all had drinks later? Like, explain what it was happened. A, it was that. a lecture-based. Um, so 
uh, you know, we came into the classroom. Uh, it, it was it was lecture based at, at that point. Um, <laughs> there was some more advanced stuff in, in other training classes I received later on. Uh, but that went in specifically, it was just lecture based. OK. In the academy, through all these trainings that you had, how many times were you tested afterwards? At the academy? Yes. For gang investigations or any type of gang uh, recognition, um, might have had one test, if any. If it, so, you're not sure. I'm not. I, I honestly, I cannot recall at the academy. It's been it's been a while. If I had been tested on gangs, then. <laughs> now. After the academy, how many times have you been to, or how many times have you been tested at these trainings? So, uh, Georgia Gang Investigator Association, every um, every course that we t that we offer and take, um, it there is an administered test. Uh, there is a practical exercises. There are uh, lecture based as well. Um, some of the some of the training encompasses uh, lectures from prosecutors and law enforcement. Uh, but some of the training is also um, from gang members' perspectives from uh, across the nation, whether it's um, self-admission videos uh, or talking about how the um, how the gangs started uh, in different different parts of the United States, for example, or uh, different interviews of uh, gang members actually uh, talking about the organization themselves. Okay, so after the academy, through all of these administered tests, how many did you fail? None. The academy during these administered tests, how many did you get some of the questions wrong on? Um, I don't recall getting questions wrong. And how long have you been practice, uh, practicing? How long have you been um, doing what you do? Uh, I, for approximately a little over eight years. Okay. Uh, and most most of my experience uh, has been with gang investigations. Uh, so when I started out at the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, I actually started out in corrections. Uh, and my day to day operations was um, the just interacting with inmates and taking care of their needs. That's where I learned a lot uh, and had a lot of uh, interpersonal uh, conversations with inmates and learning in, uh, about criminal street gangs. I uh, a, a lot of it was just me asking questions like, hey, what does this mean? Or why, or what does, uh, why aren't y'all uh, getting along with other organizations and learning it that way. And I'm going to get to that, but I, we need to stick to training first because that's- what Yeah, we're absolutely. Doing. Okay, so for the, for, the, for the eight years you've been doing what you do, you've never failed a test or even got anything wrong? No. Okay. I, I may have gotten recall if I have missed or how many. Well, the testing that you did, was it blind testing? Blind testing? Yes. Like, uh, did you know it was a test? Did I, did I know I was taking a test when I was taking a test? Well, well, that's just it. During your training, when you were given whatever, did you know you were giving a test? Let's leave it at that first, and I'll take the next step. So when you were administered these tests, did you know it was a test? You were going to be given the test, and you would be te you basically test on what you just heard or, or saw. Yes. Okay. Was there any time that you were given a test that you didn't know was a test until afterwards? I don't believe so. No. Okay. So no blind testing. Got gotcha. you. No. So based off of the training that you have, can you explain to us? You, you talked about some of the the sources you use for collecting evidence. Walk us through that. How were you trained to? basically pick out sources to collect your gang evidence? Um, so we have, I mean, I've had, had special training on social media collection, uh, mobile forensic uh, extractions, as well as um, they were lectured to us as well, and specifically these gang courses, specifically the intermediate gang investigator course that I've been certified in, uh, goes into uh, a lot of the digital extraction of gang evidence. Um, but also uh, in basic, they are very adamant about uh, what type of evidence is gang evidence uh, because it's stated in the definition of the code book. Gotcha. So, and, and that's what I want to talk about. You're telling us what it was. Walk us through how did you get to the sources? How do the sources help you investigate? How were you trained to use these sources to help you investigate gang cases? That's what I'm looking for. 
Okay. Uh, do you want me like any specific one? Yeah, don't no, because there's a million. Of them, so that's just what I'm saying. Can, can you kind of give me one that you would like me to talk about? The first thing you said was social media collection. Let's okay. start there. Uh, so, so um, with social media collection, uh, there's obviously there's different types of social media accounts, whether it's social, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, uh, or, or one of the other apps that may be there. Um, there's also different categories, whether it's something that's private or public. Uh, public information is just what it is is public. So typically, if I see something on a public Facebook, Instagram, or anything public internet-wise, uh, typically how I collect that is I use a snippet tool, which is a Microsoft snippet tool. Um, I will take a, a screenshot or a screen grab of, of that picture, typically with a date, if it is there, because sometimes it counts, so depending on the date range, uh, may not show a date uh, or different limited privacy settings might be have might have limited information by time I, i'll take a snap it or a, a snag it of that posting uh save it to a file or then save it into a uh, report and that's how i would preserve um something publicly off social media um, if i was going through a instagram or uh like a, like or a facebook search warrant return um you get a lot of a lot of different data with those returns. Um, not all of it is uh, necessarily relevant to gang evidence, but the, what I would do is uh, parcel that information out, whether it's pictures, videos, and if I see something relevant uh, to uh, my gang investigation, I would save it or maybe mark it into a, a separate folder. Let's start there, or let's stop there. Okay. So you find something, thousands of pictures, videos, all that. You find something that you determine is relevant, or that, you, that may be relevant. Correct. Now, through your training and experience, walk us through how you determine, A, it actually is relevant, or B, it actually is not. Uh, so I'm always looking at the totality. So if I'm looking at an individual um, who I'm trying to s determine what, what organization he may be a part of, um, if I see he's wearing a uh, red shirt, that may or may not be relevant, um, but it could be. If I see that individual is then throwing a hand sign that is associated with the criminal street gang of uh, any type of blood organization, for example, uh, that red shirt could become relevant, but it's not always. Uh, the hand sign picture would, would gear me to, to believe that that would be relevant to the investigation. Uh, if I see numerous pictures of that individual throwing hand signs, I would save all those to the side. If I see uh, the individual uh, then using purposeful misspellings under a picture or commenting something relevant underneath a picture or interacting with another member uh, or associate uh, in a way, that could also be term relevant. But I would never say someone is associated or a member of a criminal street gang uh, based off of just one, one element of any of those. I, I, wouldn't, I, would, I always like to look at the totality of it uh, to, to make my determination. And I use those terms as, um, uh, as a cluster of identifiers, so multiple different identifying signs because um, someone could just be wearing uh, the color blue because they honestly like the color blue and they have nothing to do with the, with the criminal street gang, uh, which happens. In your training, have you been, um, well, I guess, have you been trained to determine whether or not a person is an actual member, an associate, a family member, a friend, or anything like that? Uh, so I have been trained in that. Uh, essentially, there, I know a lot of different organizations, they use uh, uh, security threat group calculators and calculations to do a point system. Uh, those point systems for security threat groups uh, is independent to their own policies and procedures. Um, the law doesn't stipulate how many points a person is or isn't to be an associate or a member of an organization. Uh, but a member can be identified as self-admission. If someone tells me, yes, I'm a member of this organization. Uh, if I have evidence that that individual was beat into the, to the organization or the, or the criminal street gang. Uh, if I have uh, evidence from maybe a book of knowledge or some type of ledger that's saying, hey, this person is a member, uh, that that could be considered evidence of someone's membership. Um, association 
<clears throat> to me is uh, further than just being a family member of a individual who is documented being in a criminal street gang. Association to me would be someone who is regularly in, in communication, interaction with someone who is also either associated or a member. And then they commit criminal street gang activity together. And you said some organizations use it. Do you use the point system? I do not. Okay, you do not use the point system. No. And there's a reason why I personally don't use a point system. Uh, besides it not being required by law, but uh, two, uh, there are certain circumstances uh, that happen across that we may see. For an example, uh, if an individual, this is their initiate, their, there's a certain crime being initiated by this individual to actually join the organization. Uh, this person just started, they're joining the gang. They might not have tattoos. They might not have postings on social media. They might not be wearing clothing and signs. In theory, they have no points, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But if they go and commit a, commit a crime their very first day in furtherance of the criminal street gang organization, then based on a point system, it would fail essentially on the point system aspect. And that is why I do not use a point system. And a couple more questions, I promise. Based off of your training, can you tell us how do you determine whether or not a person is false claiming? So false claiming is a, um, is a big deal. The reason why it is a big deal is because uh, someone who is false claiming a organization, if they are met with a, another individual from the organization that they are actually claiming, uh, that individual would be violated uh, by assault or some type of extreme violence uh, for false claiming into that organization. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not good to s claim something that you're not, especially in this, in this culture. Uh, and it is typically met with violence. Okay, but based off of your training, we understand it is dangerous, but yes. based off of your training, can you walk us, can you tell us how do you determine whether or not a person is false claiming or not. Yeah, I mean, there, there's several ways you could tell if someone was false claiming, I, I suppose. Um, if someone is, uh, one, claiming that they're part of something, and if, then they recant and say that I'm not part of this, and there's actual factual basis that they're not. Um, if they're at one point claiming, and they're actually claiming uh, part of another gang, I suppose, uh, that would also show that they're false claiming, uh, but that doesn't, doesn't happen very, very often at all. Uh, it's very rare. Gotcha. That you know of. Through your that I know of, yes, through my experience. I, I have seen it. Um, I have seen very small handful of uh, cases where someone was false claiming and then that was retaliated with violence. Uh, so... All right. And you testify that you've qualified as an, you've been qualified as an expert seven times in Fulton, Cherokee and Clayton. Yes, sir. All right. Um, let's start in Fulton. And how many times were you t or qualified in Fulton? Uh, I believe three or four. All right. And those three or four times, how many times did you go through a 702 hearing? So the judge made the determination. Uh, I believe uh, every time I've gone through my experience. Well, how many your experience through a, through, yes. a, through a Daubert hearing, through an actual Daubert hearing. This is my fir very first Daubert hearing. Okay, so you didn't go through a Daubert hearing in Fulton. No, you didn't go through a Daubert hearing in Cherokee. I have not. You didn't go through a Daubert hearing in Clayton. I have not. All right. Now, those seven times, what type of expert were you deemed as during the trial? Uh, typically, I was deemed a expert in uh, criminal street gang culture. Um, and it was it was essentially that that broad i don't think it was ever like specifically on one specific gang gotcha and my last question in this case did you conduct did you help or were you part of the investigation to collect the gang evidence in this case yes. uh yes i have been
And were you the lead on that part? I was not the lead investigator, no. Who, oh, that was Liam Packer? That, Liam Packer, yes. Yeah, I gotcha. One moment, please. No further questions, Your Honor. Oh, no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. I mean, since the other defendants signed on to it, Ms. Jones or uh, Ms. Bumpus, do you have any further questions? I have no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Don't have any further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Oakham? Ah, uh, Your Honor. Just one quick question. In all those seven cases, was it the judge that qualified you as a gang expert? Yes, every time. Okay. Thank you. I don't have, I don't believe I have other questions. That's your qualifications, Judge. All right. You're excused. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. So, y'all want to do an argument now? Yes. Please. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, it's clear that the witness is in fact a gang expert. He's been test he's testified uh several times that he's uh and he's been qualified as an expert. He also um has said um he's uh careers in gang investigations, he has training, he teaches classes, he's been certified. I believe his qualifications as a gang expert is clear. Um the courts have also <laughs> ruled on um <coughs> gang information. There are various uh, cases on it. I can provide it to the court, but there are various cases about qualifications of gangs, how um, um, <coughs> excuse me, how because of um, the signs and the symbols, the regular um, people would not be able to um, testify to that. And so therefore an expert in that um, Field should be able to explain to um, the jurors the symbols, the signs, the memberships, how they thrive, what kind of gangs exist. Uh, Investigator Miller has testified that he is, in fact, um, he holds a position over the Metro Atlanta um, area. He keeps up with his intelligence. He um, they have, I think, meetings twice a month, and then some other meetings. Uh, he's familiar with the Atlanta gangs. Um, he's over the whole Metro Atlanta, which includes, I think, Cobb County, Gwinnett, Fulton, mm -hmm. is what he said in Clayton County. Um, he has testified in court before. This is all he does. Um, and for all of these reasons, Judge, uh, the state believes that he's been qualified as an expert for the gang portion of it, and he should be able to testify to that information during trial, Judge. Okay, Mr. Hoover. So, get some mic. <clears throat> so just so I'm clear on how to frame the argument, are we, you're just qualifying him as a gang expert, period? Well, I'm qualifying him as, well, we didn't go into the facts of the case. True. But for the facts of this particular case, you'll be testifying as to, I provided it with the, I provided defense already, but I believe the gangs involved in this case would be, uh, hang on. I apologize, Your Honor. So it would be the Bloods, um, the subset of the Bloods where uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Green, which would be the Gangster Killer Bloods, also known as G Shine. Mr. Wheeler is a subset of uh, the Bloods, which is also. Sex Money Murder and Slaughter Gang. Mr. Bynes uh, is a subset that goes on the Robin Hood, which is a subset of the Shady Park Crips, which is an Atlanta-based Rolling 60s Crip set. And then Mr. King is a member of PDE. Uh, so his subset, and Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rhodes is also a member of G-Shine. So it would be a combination of the Bloods, the Crips, and that, but we would tailor it to that. So we're not, 
if that makes sense. Does that make sense what I'm saying? We will be tailored to the gangs that they're involved in with an overview of the hybrid gangs in Atlanta. I got you. But we would tailor it to the gangs that he investigated and he found that the defendants were members of. So I guess we're not going to spend the whole time talking about all the gangs, yeah. just that they exist and then we do. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, fair enough. But I mean, we got to make it double sure that he's here. We're running out of rope. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Hoover. Just what? I, I mean, I know you were asking her. It, did that answer the question for the record as far as what uh, the state is asking um, Mr. Miller to be qualified as an expert on? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Now, um, to start off, Your Honor, this is actually obviously a 702 hearing, but at the beginning you said Daubert, and there's a little difference. So, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I've been reading back up there. They're, they're, and just to get it because you you cited the tire and the exactly. Daubert, and it, well, I forget the third case sort of sort of combined together have created the the statute, the exactly. 702 statute. But, so, but go for, ahead. for this particular expert, because there's not a, a scientific methodology that you're using, what we're told in Georgia is that the state the court has to look at two things. Number one, whether the testimony has a reliable basis in yeah. the knowledge and the experience. And number two, whether the information provided is specialized such that it assists the juror in something they, that they wouldn't otherwise already have knowledge of. So I want to start with the second part, simply because that's where the state ended. The state said that um, there was testimony that he, he could tell us about signs, he could tell us about symbols um, of gangs, and that's going to assist the jury. I have to start with... Almost anywhere else in Georgia, I might actually agree with that, Your Honor, but this is Atlanta. Unfortunately, there are, what, three high-profile gang cases going on right now. There's, we, the jury in Atlanta, in Fulton County, for, for instance, does not need an expert to tell them what hand signals are or what colors are. I mean, that's common knowledge at this point. That's, those have been after-school specials since I was in like elementary school, since the 80s and 90s. If he's only going to provide what a, what a hand signal is, um, what symbols are, what colors mean, that doesn't go to 702 standard under Kumotai or anything as to where he needs to assist a jury in that. A jury in Fulton County of all places, since we're literally bombarded with it every single day, that's not, that, that, that's not enough for him to say or for the, for the, for the um, state to say, well, he's an expert because he assists the jury in that. Um, there is no assist in that at all because that's basically common knowledge at this point. Now, if he had testimony that he was providing something a little more specific, and I even tried to ask him, in your training, you talked about the hand signals, you talked about the colors, but in your training, walk us through what does all this mean? Was it he didn't really do that. He just kept saying, well, we talked about to different people about the different hand signs. We talked to different people about the colors and the agenda. We still don't know what more specific than hand signs and colors. So at that point... I think the state fails at 702 because a Fulton County jury does not need to does not need assistance in hand size and color. I mean, I don't know if I buy that, really. I mean, they, they I mean, yeah, I've, it, there's probably a general awareness, but I mean, the state's charged each one of these people with participation in a criminal street gang activity. It's their burden to prove it. Uh, the jury's going to have to weigh that and, and they'll be charged with it. And so. Uh, you know they, they they've got to lay out their case and 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 prove that that these defendants participated in a criminal street gang activity and i agree 100% that they do have to lay out their case and they're the ones that have to prove it what i'm saying is this is not the person that should be deemed an expert to prove it your honor you hit the nail on the on the on the head when you said yourself there's a general awareness an expert is not supposed to testify to information that's a general awareness. An expert is supposed to testify to something that the juror wouldn't already otherwise know. There's a difference. A general awareness means just that. Generally in society, we know about it already. This expert's not giving extra information. They're giving general information just like you just said. So that's why I don't think it passes the second part of 702. Okay. Now moving on to um, whether the testimony has a reliable basis in the knowledge and experience. First off, Your Honor, um, I'm weary of any expert that says that they've never failed anything a day in their life since they've been an expert. It doesn't really work like that. I mean, e even 
let's go back to law school. Lawyers and judges aren't experts, but we know more than the average person when it comes to the law. I don't know a single judge or lawyer they can go through and say, since they've been practicing law, they've never been wrong on anything. If I told you that right now that I've not been a judge, I've never been wrong. <laughs> right, of course. But I think we should take a step back and listen because the expert said something like that. We should take a step back and listen to the actual testimony. Again, I tried to get what actually did you learn? And it sounded like they all were in a conference room. People got up and talked. Then afterwards, they clapped and went out and had some drinks. Like we, we still don't know the, 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 they didn't, the, the expert did, I'm sorry, the witness didn't delve into his experience so he can properly tell you that I was trained to do this and I was trained to do that. So this is why what I'm saying is reliable. <clears throat> when it comes to um, the type of sources that they use, first off, every single class that this, this witness has taken um, was law enforcement, which that's kind of a red flag, but I, I won't belabor the argument too much. There's no, uh, there's, there are no um, um, professors that are, are writing PhDs that he's consulted with. They didn't talk about any white paper studies that this person has been a part of. They didn't talk about any studies at all that this person is a part of. What they said was he was trained by law enforcement agencies. He goes out and works with other law enforcement agencies, and he trains law enforcement agencies at the point where it's, a, it's an entity that is literally meant to prosecute people, not that doesn't mean to find the truth. That means to prosecute people and nothing but to prosecute people. I think we have to take a step back even further. So now we're looking at a person that's never failed anything in their entire career. Their entire career is surrounded by uh, specifically prosecuting. And then it comes to, okay, well, give us specific examples of what your training was. Give us specific examples of how you were tested. Give us specific examples of what you go through. And again, like you said earlier, we got general statements on what he's what he's heard and what he's seen. We got general statements of what he's done. Um, the state harped on a lot that he's been um, deemed an expert seven times, but that's important as well, Your Honor, because number one, he's never gone through um, 702 Dalbert, 702 before Dalbert, or Kumo Tire. So no judge has had this hearing to determine whether or not he's actually done it. Now, number two... Um, I mean, I, I guess I would rebut that, though, but nobody's ever objected to the... <clears throat> to his being an, an, an expert to have the hearings. So. True, which also means, either way, it means that the court never made this determination <laughs> moving forward. Either way you want to look at it. That, you're right, but he, they've never made this determination. Secondly, um, he said it himself that he was just criminal street gang culture. Um, now, if he's going to come in and just talk about criminal street gang culture, I don't see why we need him for as an expert, specifically when it comes to, like the state said, G-Shine, um, sex Money Murder, Robin Hood, Shady Park Crips, and PDE, when he's only going to come in here and talk generally about the culture. Again, that's a Netflix after-school special that this jury does not know. At the point where we really don't know his background, he's never, no court that we know of right now has gone through, um, I guess, the gatekeeping process that we're asking you to go through because it never came up, no defense attorney objected to it, it's never been done. And I'm sorry, can you give us there's no prime example of what training he went through and how he applied it to this case. And even in this case, he wasn't even the lead when he, he just helped out in the investigation. So if the state is going to ask that he's a general gang expert, I don't believe that they've qualified him to be a general gang expert, especially when they specifically, well, that you can't be a general gang expert and then try to talk about not only two separate gangs, but multiple subsets in two separate gangs. I think either the state's going to have to narrow this down, which I don't think we've had testimony for that, or I don't believe this person or this state has laid the proper foundation under 702 Kumo Tire for him to be a general gang expert for this trial. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Holcomb. Your Honor, I believe it's pretty clear. Uh, he's testified that he's an expert. I would also, the witness did not say that he had never failed an exam. He said, I don't recall which ones I have missed and which ones I have not missed, but I'm sure I have. That's exactly what he said. And he tried to get clarification of what I, but he said, I have never actually failed the test on gang expert, that he said. But whether he never failed the question, that's not what he said. Point one, point two, <laughs> judge, um, gang expert, he didn't, he didn't really talk about what his training <clears throat> was. He's talking about at the academy, but he also said that he took training classes with different people he talked to people that were in the gangs before, admissions. He talked to uh, people while he was a sheriff that had been, <coughs> I'm 
<coughs> sorry, excuse me, in gangs, he talks and I taught courses, he'd been trained, he'd been certified both in intermediate and basic gang training. We are tailoring this case. We do not go into the facts of the case for for expert testimony. Expert testimony is are you are you an expert in the field? That is the requirement. Not are you an expert in the bloods? Are you expect in the I was just telling Mr. Hoover for purposes of the trial, we're not going to spend two days talking about all of the gangs in Atlanta because there are quite a few. We would tailor that testimony, his testimony to the gangs that apply to this case. But you have to be an expert in gang culture and in the gangs, which is what he testified to. And now for purposes of trial, he's not going to sit here and talk about all of the gangs in Atlanta because the objection will be relevant. It is not relevant to the case we are having. And so he would tailor his testimony, obviously, to the gangs that the state is alleged that the defendants are part of. But all the expert testimony is required that he be an expert in gang culture and in gangs. The state's position is that the, uh, the witness has has um, 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 giving enough information to show that he is an expert in the field of gang culture and in gangs and all the gangs and involvement in gangs and how gangs and what a gang is. I would also know for the record, Your Honor, it is it is not true that common people know what gangs are, the colors and the signs and the symbols of what they mean and how it's in furtherance of the gang, as he explained. Just because you're doing or three people, you have to prove the nexus that it is in furtherance of the gang. And normal people do not know that. And the idea that they're because there are three, oh, I guess two gang cases going on, people doesn't mean that everybody is interested in what's going on. I would just speak for myself, Your Honor. I'm not interested in what the YFN case is or what the YSL case is going on. I know that there's a case going on, but I haven't watched any of it or been interested in it. And I'm a prosecutor. And so this idea that it's common knowledge that they're, everybody knows what gangs are in Atlanta and what the hybrids are doing, I, I, it's just a fallacy, Your Honor. Uh, the witness has been uh, deemed an expert before. Um, obviously the defense will have cross to cross examine whatever he says and however he says it during sure, trial. Sure. But the basis of, is he qualified to testify on this? gang culture and gang state believes that we have met <clears throat> and he should be deemed an expert for those purposes. Well, let, let me ask you this, because I mean, there, there's different case law on it. It's still 702 based on the federal and how it fits in. Um, how, how does it, um, the relevancy, how, how, how do you foresee his testimony assisting the, the jury in, in the trial? Well, Your Honor, that's the basis of it. Why was, because the state has to prove that this would be in furtherance of gang activity. Yeah. That's the criminal street gang, that's the act. And this uh, witness would testify to how, why, because there are three different gangs for purpose. I mean, we do go into the facts because we're just trying to- Sure, I, just generally speaking, so generally, I don't need- three different either. gangs that were involved. The normal person would be like, well, how is this in furtherance of the gang when there's the G-Shine, the PD, that, that's offices of the cribs and the sex money murder. How is this in front of us of a gang? Because there are multiple gangs already named. The experts will be able to testify that this is Atlanta, hybrid gangs, what happens in Atlanta, and this is how it's in front of us of the gang. The defense obviously will cross examine him to their heart's content and say, this is not in front of us of the gang, or this is not a gang, or however their defense is. But it does not remove from the fact that he's in fact an expert and <clears throat> in that field, and he gets to testify. And an expert witness testimony, I mean, the jury instruction pretty much says it, does not mean that you have to take their word for what it is. You still have to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. it you're making an argument. It speaks to weight. I'm, I'm yes. the gatekeeper and all this. So that's, that's I, what it I, is. I get they still it, but... have to sift through it and decide yeah. yay or nay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I see y'all are. <laughs> you you can add a little bit to it if you want to. Uh, and and I will add, Your Honor, from experience specifically, I won't even go outside of Fulton County, but from train or trials here in Fulton County, when the state tries to prove a nexus, what they do is they put their expert up there and they say, this is gang activity. From my experience, this is what gangs do. And that's not how you prove a nexus. We don't know. Like We haven't seen anything yet that says that this expert can say not only this is what gangs do, not the general no. stuff, but this is specifically what they do. But 
these are the facts in this case and these facts, this is what I looked at and I can show a jury to say that this was gang activity. All he do he can do right now is get up there and say, this is what gangs do generally. And because we can rhyme words together, armed robbery and armed robbery, that means that it's gang activity, which that's not how you prove a nexus. And it should they should not be able to allow to use a general witness to prove that. Okay. Well, I, I, I've 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 heard it through, and I, I'll go ahead and make my ruling from the bench. I'm going to rule him as qualified as a uh, uh, as a gang expert. I think he's shown his qualifications. Uh, he has experience at it. Um, he has testified as an expert in seven prior trials. I don't really buy the argument that um, he didn't go through 702 because. I see it as a fact that nobody ever felt the need to object to this before. So the, you know, the gate was never closed on him to begin with. And I'm, I'm going to open as the gatekeeper, I'm going to open it back up. I think that the methodology, he, as I said, he has shown he's, he's taught a number of courses on it. He's member of local organizations with law enforcement, uh, talking about, um, talking about his, uh, experiences and, and uh, and and the networking and the teaching on it and the research, um, I think the testimony is relevant to assist the trier of fact. But as I mentioned before, I'm simply the gatekeeper on it. If you don't feel there was a nexus or you don't feel there was enough, I'm sure we'll hear about it in your, uh, you know, on your cross and your closing. And uh, to finish it up with the Rule 403 balancing test, I, I, I do think that the probative value outweighs any prejudicial effect. Ms. Oakham, can you uh, submit me a proposed order on this? Yes, Judge. I okay, agree. thank you. And, and the other two arguments we have left here, I know we'll be able to get to the 418 because it's 520, but we need to talk about the search warrants and as well as the Jackson Dedo. Uh, we haven't heard arguments on those, Judge. <clears throat> okay. So, um, as to this, I, I don't know how you would like, would like the state to go first. Would you like, cause this is the defense motion, I guess they get to go first. I believe they do. I'll sit. <laughs> go ahead, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as to, uh, <clears throat> Jackson v. Dedo hearing, Your Honor, um, in regard to that second, um, the second interview that you did hear, which was nine minutes long. Uh, the officer in terms, the detective rather, indicated that he did not uh, give Miranda warnings, even though my client was in custody, even though he was giving answers in regard. This is good. I, I completely forgot we didn't do it. It's going to make my court reporter real happy here that we're, we're <laughs> But but it, it has to be done. I, 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 I'm, I'm upset myself that we didn't address the argument. But go ahead, Miss Jones. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, he talked about that he wanted to initially talk about the probation aspect of it, but he's a detective for Fulton County. He's not Mr. Uh, Green's uh, probation officer. Um, the violation wasn't even in Fulton County. He simply wanted to get him into custody for further questioning, which begs the question of why not immediately when you go into a room where you want to question about specific case that you don't give Miranda warnings. He initially indicated that, well, he wanted to kind of soften the, the fact that uh, Mr. Green uh, was a little bit upset at the first meeting that they had. And so he wanted to sort of grease the wheel, so to speak, and and talk about how he didn't really um, he didn't know that there was actually a search warrant or I'm sorry, a probation warrant until um, such time as he inquired further. Um, and again, we heard in the, I think the tape um, will speak for itself as well. He goes into this long diatribe about the facts of the case and and um, how if he had a child, he'd want, you know, everybody to know the truth. And not once did he then put in the Miranda warnings. He certainly could have done the Miranda warnings and then gave his little speech about uh, mamas and, and children, but he chose purposely not to do that, Your Honor. Um, he did not give Miranda rights. Therefore, we, we believe that the whole statement should be excluded. Um, and additionally, I would just add um, that he did ask questions and he asked, asked specifically, where is his cell phone? And when he again, Mr. Green reiterated or at least indicated he didn't want to speak. So for all of those reasons, Your Honor, we would request that the second interview um, be suppressed. 
I'm trying to remember what his, and I'll go back and look at it, but what, what was his response when he was asked about the cell phone? I guess I'm trying to figure out why that, that's important to you, to be blunt about it. Because it looks like, it shows like, I, I believe he indicated he it didn't have or he wasn't going to turn it over or something along those lines, Your Honor. Again, it shows a, a lack of cooperation. And, you know, that's okay. the whole reason for Miranda right. is they don't have to cooperate. They don't yeah. have to talk to the police. They don't have to do anything. It's the police's yeah. job to do that. And tricking yeah. him into talking is, is, is a violation of Miranda. Okay. All right, Ms. Holcomb. Thank you. I just so they were clear. So the first interview is fine then. Where will we argue about the second one? We'll just stand on the record in regard to that, Your Honor. Um, you will be listening to it. Um, I believe the officer testified that um, he wasn't um, in custody. I don't, I think that that interview was an hour long. Again, um, there is a question of uh, custodial, but we will we'll submit it on the record. Okay. Your Honor, after the first interview, it's pretty clear Miranda is being required when the person is in custody. Uh, that's the only point you're supposed to give Miranda. The defendant was not in custody. Mr. Green was not in custody. Mr. Green, what is in his house? His apartment. The officers went to his house. When he told the officers to leave, the officers left his house. He was never arrested. He was left at his house when they left. So clearly, that is not a custodial interrogation. So... Miranda is not required. The law is pretty clear on that. Yeah. So for purposes of that, um, the law is pretty clear. It's so <laughs> you have to be in custody for you to be giving Miranda. He was not in custody. He was at home. <clears throat> he told the officers to leave his house. They left his house. He was at his house. So therefore, that whole statement should come in. Um, the law is pretty clear on that. Now, so the second part, the state's admits, well, not admits, I'm sorry, we concede he was in custody. He was. Yeah. He was at the police station. Just after the fugitive unit picked him up, <laughs> yes. you concede that he was in custody, he was but... In custody. Uh... For purposes of arguments, he was in custody. And um, the, um, the case law says that when you're in custody that you're supposed to be given Miranda before interrogations believe. I think the issue here the state is having where we disagree with the defense is that he was not interrogated. For you to be given Miranda, and I think the case law is pretty clear, Inter interrogation is any express questioning by law enforcement officers or its functional equivalents, any words or actions by the police that the person should reasonably believe is likely to elicit incriminating statements. All Detective Leon Packer asked was, you probably feel deceived, right? And then he went into the diatribe. Detective Leon Packer tried well, wait a minute now. There, there was a lot of time in between the di the, di the diatribe, Detective uh, Packer talking about just all the search warrants oh, he had on his buddies. Yes. And, uh, I started from the beginning, Judge. I agree with you. So, okay. so first, right. the first right. question right. was, you feel deceived. Yeah. Right? This is why I wanted to play it. And the defendant responded, something's bad. You told me I didn't have a warrant. Da -da 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 -da. And he went into his diatribe. And when detective tried to say way he said no i'm talking now i something that affects i'm talking now um when i'm done you can talk detective tried again and he was like i'm still talking and then he went into his diatribe about i didn't want to give you my phone because my phone had gang stuff in it he had gun stuff in it and um i don't want to talk to you you don't want to talk i don't want to talk to you i don't want to say anything i don't I, i'm not talking to you he went in through all of that diatribe. that's the first part then after that is when detective leon packer said look you talked, now I'm going to talk, you listen. And he started talking. And at that point, Detective Leon Packer said, things have changed. Before, you were not under arrest. Now, before I talk to you or before I say anything to you, I'm going to have to read you your Miranda. Before, and then he explained, this is why I want to talk to you. But before we even have any conversation, any of that stuff, I'm going to have to read you your Miranda first. After I read you your Miranda, then you can decide if you want to talk to me or not. And at that point, he said, well, you can't make me talk. You don't want me to talk. And he says, I don't want, I don't need you to talk. I don't want you, if you don't want to talk, you don't have to talk. And then when he's leaving, he, <clears throat> he asks for his cell phone. Asking for your cell phone is not eliciting incriminatory, what's the word? That should reasonably know that it's likely to elicit incriminatory statements. All he asked for was the cell phone. Yeah. Literally, that was it. Where is your cell phone? And he said, go get a warrant for it. He was like, I will. 
And that was the end of the conversation. So the state's position is that there was never any actual interrogation. The defendants, they're talking, the first part of the statements, the first part of it, where he was like, where he was, when Detective Leon Parker um, tried to interject, he said, no, I'm talking now. And he goes into the fact that, oh, I have gone, I have gun, was I have guns on my phone, I have gang activity on my phone. None of that was any question that Detective Leon Packer posed to him. Literally, all Detective Leon Packer said was, "You feel deceived." That's it. And then he went into this whole diatribe about their guns on his phone, they're this, they're, they're harassing him, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're doing that. Ne there was never a question asked by Detective Leon Packer that would elicit any of that information that the defendant gave. After that was when Detective Leon Packer said, you've taught, let me talk. And he tried to interject again and Detective Leon Packer said, no, I'm talking now. And that's when he told him that these situations have changed now. You are not free to leave. You are not free to go anywhere. If you want to talk, I have to read you your Miranda. And the defendant said he did not want to talk. And Detective Leon Becker said, okay. And then as he was leaving, all he asked for was, where is your cell phone? That's it. Asking somebody for where your cell phone is, is not likely to, what is the word again? Likely to elicit incriminatory statements. He was investigating a robbery, the armed robbery at Velvet Taco. All of the information that the, detect the defendant volunteered was not as, uh, was not from interrogation by Detective Leo Packer. He didn't ask him a question, apart from the question about where's your cell phone. Everything else in that, there was no question posed at all. And so the state's position is that, <clears throat> and I think it's also pretty clear with case law, when the witness volunteers information without questioning by, <clears throat> by the, um, the law enforcement officer, then he volunteered that information because he was never asked about the guns on his phone or the gangs, or, I'm sorry, the guns and the gangs and the incriminating statements on his phone. That was never asked. Nobody asked him that. He volunteered that information. And so you cannot backdoor say, I have, because he kept saying, I don't want to talk. I have, I want to talk to my attorney. You cannot say that and provide information and then backdoor it and say, you were not read your Miranda way you specifically said, you don't want to talk. And he said, fine, you don't have to talk. Right. But I'm telling you, this is the facts that I have. And before we talk, no talk. I have to give you a Miranda because situations have changed now. You cannot backdoor giving all of that information to the detective and saying he should have read you a Miranda. You never gave him the opportunity to read you your Miranda and he never interrogated you because he never actually asked you a question. Well, I, I don't know who's backdooring who on this, but uh, <laughs> I, I need to. Uh, and well, I don't mean that. I don't know. You might have more argument to make. No, no, Your Honor. I mean, that's the state's position. There was never an interrogation. He was in custody. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But there was never yeah. an actual interrogation made. The defendant volunteered all that information. And the case law is pretty clear. I can find, I can quote, I can email you the case's judge. If a defendant volunteers information after he asks for an attorney, the state is by no obligation. That is not supposed to be suppressed because we never asked him any question. The police never asked him any question. He volunteered that information. All right. That's the state's position, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Gomez. Then again, Your Honor, the easy fix would have been, he knew he was in custody. Just go ahead and read the Miranda rights, and then they can talk about maybe how he felt deceived um, and, and the like, Your Honor. Here, he went in, he, and he basically indicated, you feel deceived, in which my client got irritated again, and he talked about, I got nothing to do with nothing. What do we think he's talking about? Do we think he's talking about the probation violation? No, he's talking about the, the, the velvet robbery that happened, that he was questioned on, and he felt he was being treated unfairly by being asked those questions. So the officer clearly came in there with the intent to try to soften him up before he read Miranda rights, and that is not the law. And not only that, Your Honor, whether or not he's on probation, it's probably going to be, I'll probably have to do a motion in limine anyway, because the jury doesn't get to hear he's on probation. So why are we even talking about that in the first place? <clears throat> and second, Your, uh, Your Honor, he did indicate, hey, whoa, 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 stop. Um, things have changed, and now I've got to read you your rights. And did he read the rights then? 
No. He goes into this whole long diatribe to try to make Mr. Green feel guilty about and you know, if, if I had a, a son, this is what I would want to do. This is all of the new evidence I have against you. You know, now I want to talk to you. That's not how Miranda works. Miranda works by you sit down, he's in custody, you read the rights. And nine times out of 10, I've been a criminal lawyer for a long time. They talk. <laughs> Here, he didn't. And so this, I'm not even sure what the point of this whole uh, conversation for nine minutes is coming in because part of it you can't even introduce regarding the probation aspect. So I guess they just want to put in that he spontaneously talked about a gun and gang activity, but he also interspersed that with the Velvet Taco robbery. And again, this could have been handled by the detective reading Miranda off the rip. And I can tell you, this is one of the first ones where I haven't seen that actually done. They come in, detectives do, they read the Miranda rights, and then they sit down and they talk. All right. You know, I think there's one more search warrants. All right, oh. yeah, well, I'm gonna... Yes, yeah. I, I'm gonna be brief. Okay, I was gonna say, I'm gonna take this under advisement. I wanna dig a little bit into the case law, but let's, let's go on into the search warrants. Oh. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, in regard to the search warrants, we filed this prior to us having um, all of the affidavits in regard to um, the search warrants. And that's why I was asking the detective in regard to, you know, do you have, you know, four, five, six, and seven? Um, there is case law out there, uh, State v. Wilson. It's a newer case. Um, 315 Georgia 613, it's a 2023 Supreme Court decision that talks about um, search warrants and their affidavits have to be particularized. And um, in regard, they can't be fishing expeditions for a lack of a better word. Um, and in reviewing all of this, we'll just, and the state did go ahead and submit the um, certified copies. So your honor, we'll just stand on the record in regard to that. Um, and just give you that case law that they have to be um, particularized um, in regard to what they're- What's that site again? Yes, sir. Um, and I, 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 I've read quite a bit on cell phone and social yes. media search warrants, but- It's uh, State v. Wilson, 315, Georgia, 613. Oh, wait, is that the new one that just came out? 23, yeah. It was in oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've got that case already. There's all also right, Perez right, yeah. v. State that came out on May. Yeah, you yeah there were a lot, a lot of lot of writing going on in, the, in that one. So I will go back and read yes. Wilson. Yes, so we'll just uh, stand on the submissions and just point you to that case law. Okay, Ms. Oakham? Yon, I believe uh, the search warrant speaks for itself, the certified copies. I would just note that each search warrant, the detective specifically asked he asked, he gave the location, he gave the date range, he gave the time. So it wasn't a fishing expedition. And the probable cause affidavits speak for themselves um, on each different uh, warrants that the detective applied for. Um, he was specific, it was a range. Um, he gave the reasons why he wanted it. He asked for the specific items that he wanted. Um, he particularized each individual search warrant of all the things that he was asking for. Uh, he gave dates, he gave times, um, he gave a range. Um, he asked for the exact location, the longitude, the latitude. Um, I would say for all the search warrants I've had, we do this for a while too, these ones are the most specific and detailed of which particular reason and date and time that he wanted. Yeah. So these search warrants are Incredibly detailed, Judge. It was he gave the time, the dates, the reasons why, and the location. And so clearly, which is why all the judges that read them didn't ha have any further questions for him because they were that detailed and specific. And so the search warrants <clears throat> for themselves, Judge. We stand on you know, certified okay. copies, and I would believe all of them are valid. And I don't believe that the defense has stated any reason why. They're not valid at this point. Uh, just standing on the record. There's no issue with right. what's particularly wrong with any of them. Mm -hmm. So they speak for themselves, Judge. And so for these reasons, uh, the state's position is that all the search warrants are valid. Um, Me. And I would also note that this case law is also clear that deference should be given to the magistrate court uh, for search warrants when they are giving. Um, there is no 
as of now, I don't see what is wrong with the search warrants. I've been told what is wrong with any of them. Just that case law says they should be particularized, but which search warrants is not particular? We don't have that. Which search warrants is too broad? None of that is on the record. And so for all of those reasons, Judge States believes that um, their motion fails and that the search warrants are all valid, Judge. All right, we'll take that on their advisement as well. Um, so Ms. Jones, we're done with your you and your client, right? Yeah, just except for the 418. It's 5-4-2. Pardon me? 5 4 <laughs> Well, I don't know what you suggest. Um, it seems like... Um, you can keep going if that's what your honor wants, but... <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. We're just going to have to do it another day if... Uh, it, we can't say we still have to address the geofence stuff, so we have to come back another day anyway. Everyone doesn't want to stay until eight o'clock. I mean, that might be better. Okay. I mean, I love it here. I've <laughs> stayed till midnight, you know. But, the gym, uh, so you let yeah. me know. Here at the gym, this yeah. is a better workout. It's a mental workout. <laughs> All right. Well, when, when, Kathy, when can we come back and do this? Are we going to do it on the, when, when can we do this? When can we, when can we finish this up? We have a 25th date set already where everybody's going to be here. So yeah. Let's keep that since everybody's going to be here. We'll be so we don't, morning, because also. I would, uh, I mean, trial. Do trial on that day? Oh, yeah. Which day? Like I think the you're in trial too. I am. Both <laughs> are. Well, I mean, I've got, hopefully my trial will be done by then, but. Um, Let me try. Start on the 18th. It's probably the two and a half we got. Oh my lord! Yeah, it's going to take fourteen days at least. Yeah. But but our trial starts. This trial starts 29th, right? Yeah. So, is there any way we can squeeze in another time? I mean, I I I know that it has to be on one of our in person days. Holy cow! Yeah. So, um, you have a number before you call me. When are our in-person days? Monday and Thursday? Um, what about um, what about the fifteenth? What do we have on the fifteenth? That's a holiday. What holiday? Okay. All right. All right. We'll be out. We're not going to be here. <laughs> so, you can be. No, no, no we're not going to. I, I was kidding anyway. I'm not going to. What about what, what, what the civil hybrid counter is Tuesday, though? We, we wouldn't be able to bring them in, would we? I can ask and see if we can. What date is I that? I can borrow some slots. See if anybody has slots I can borrow. What? What did you say? Are you checking on the 16th? Hmm. I was just trying to see how long it's oh. going to last, but hmm. that's tight. I don't know. We, we, we... Well, why is that tight? <laughs> Monday. Excuse me. A what? Can't just do it on the 25th. I'll find somebody's car. Okay. What day are you talking about? I, I want a little bit of time to. So we can't do the 16th? Okay, you, you already have civil. Well, I know I do, but. Uh... I don't know how long it's going to last. I mean, well, here, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, yeah, but a lot, but a lot of it's default judgments and stuff. What's going on this coming Monday? I can't do Monday. Oh, we have a final group now. I think maybe they meant the 22nd. Well, what's she saying? Well, she said add it to Monday. Our deal on Monday. This, she's saying to add this to what Monday? Oh, oh. We the twenty, Your Honor. We can't do the twenty fifth. No. I was well, the only thing I don't like about twenty fifth is it doesn't give me a whole lot of. You know what? You know what? We'll we'll do it on the twenty fifth. 
I will locate another yeah. gang prosecutor to, to, to I, I be mean, here for it. Yeah. So you can't do the 25th? No, I, I could I could get one of my assistants to stand in for me. If, if, if the 25th works for everyone else, I will make it. It works for me, George. Because I will definitely be in trial before Judge Krause. All right, let, let, let's do the, the Judge Krause. I, I, I was, you're, you're up against Wright in that trial? I know, Attorney Johnson. Oh, she's got a packed fi trial calendar. That's, yes, Your Honor. They're trying to get me to trial my cases before March. You don't have any sort of time. Why do you have this timeline? I'm dr I'll be out. I'm kidding. I'm Her kidding. We'll have more trial. <laughs> they don't have another day that can cover? Well, they just, I'm, I don't know. I'm going to try as many as I can before March. That's All right, right. You know what? We'll do the 25th. Yeah. And I'll just have to figure it out. Yes. All right. Y'all are excused. Thank you, Judge. All right. Mm -hmm. oh. All right. Oh, any yes. questions? It's a fan code for the murder. Locked up. Name put on. We'll do something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm basically. Is this anyway? Oh, this is because we're not going to be working out. They're trying to get me to die before. <laughs> before I'm out for three and a half months, basically. How long are you going to be out? Uh, three months and some change. March and end of March. So end of March. So my last day will probably go. So just now. Yes. That's right. It wasn't admitted. Okay. It was. Here's a search warrant. He was admitted, Judge. Oh yeah, we're gonna. Stacy's okay. a bit too. I did. For purposes of the record, I did. I did. Did you? Yes, I said states that for, for purposes of the search warrant, you ought to state we okay. states of it two with 17 parts. At least. And that's, I said, may I approach? And I okay. gave it to you. But I'm pretty know. sure I. It, and it, if need be, I can come with you. Oh, yes. I don't know if think it was. Yeah, I, I don't think it was. Know. I don't know. I think I would have remembered if I'd said it. I said, Your Honor, uh, stay lucid. Me, stay so, to yeah, me how many parts so, I was saying. So, I said, with parts for purposes drive, of this, these are the certified the search warrants. Well, I drive you because we have to admit it for, and then we start yeah. talking about it. And I was like, Can I come and get it back? Can we, yeah, yeah, because I wanted to review yeah. that, yeah. and then I that probably so, threw everybody off because yeah. I wanted to make sure I that was what I had, and so I. I brought them out. I said, I said, Stacey's with two with 17 parts or four parts of how many all the search warrants certified. Well, I'm trying to figure out how I can clean that up. How far it is so we can know what time you'll get back. So I'll just watch. We can restate. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, that's, that's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. All right. So we're going to go back on the record. And Ms. Oakham, what are you asking to admit? States Exhibit 2, which are all the search warrants that we've been talking about. All right. Five copies of all of the search warrants, Judge. Any objection? Yeah. Okay, the state moves to admit States Exhibit 1 as well, which is the complete, um, um, what is it? Statements given by uh, Defendant Green, which would be um, the first um, statement was given November 25th. Sorry. Okay. I want to make sure I have the right dates. It's November 25th and November 27th of 2019. That is correct. Okay. The one that was played on the record is November 27th of 2019, which is approximately nine minutes and 30 something seconds. All right. Any seconds? So you're moving exhibit one and two into the record? Yes, Judge. Any objection? Uh, not from the defense. Okay, so moved. Hey, have you got a second to talk? Completely unrelated. Okay. I know you're in a, in a hurry, but... All right, we'll see ya. All right. Just come back to my chambers. It'll just be two minutes. So it's so late. I don't know if you're going to I'm going to see my guy. I'm just going to see you tomorrow. Okay. I'm gonna need everybody. We don't have court this week. To do something about those that call. It's the seizing. I'm sorry. You should have. I said I'm gonna need everybody.